And I can tell you the first reaction I get when I present data on hurricanes is you must be a climate denier. Why else would you present data showing no increase in U.S. hurricanes unless you've cooked the books or manufactured the data or, you know, aren't you reading The Guardian or The New York Times? So it is a challenge to confront people with um, empirical evidence that is completely contrary to what they've come to believe. Welcome to Mind the Shift. I am Anders Bolling. In this episode, we're going to go scientific and we're going to go political. We will speak about uh, the climate. We will speak about COVID and a bunch of other related topics, I'm sure. I'm very excited to have as my guest, Professor Roger Pilkey. Good morning and welcome to the program, Roger. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, I wanted to have you on the show already a year ago, but for some reason, we didn't manage to, to get in contact. But anyway, here you are, which is wonderful. Uh, my attention was drawn to you and your work already around 10 years ago or so when I was working uh, at a large newspaper here in Stockholm, and I was writing about climate change. And your research on extreme weather events was immensely interesting. Now, you are a professor in environmental studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder. That's right. You have an impressively broad range of research interests. And the three uh, areas that are mentioned uh, on the university website are science and technology policy, uh, technology and innovation policy, and governance of sports organizations. You hold degrees in mathematics, public policy, and political science. You're an honorary professor at a college here in Sweden, actually, in Linköping. You have received a German award for outstanding achievement in interdisciplinary climate research, which is unsurprising, I would say. And uh, before you came to Colorado University, you were a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And so it goes on. Currently, as far as I understand, you are looking into science advice in the COVID-19 pandemic in 16 countries. That's and right. so, uh, yeah, w did, did, did I get that resume pretty? Yeah, it's very correctly? generous. I can only go downhill from there. So okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, that's not ex excellent, but it's funny. Anyway, so, and you're pretty active on Twitter as far as I can see. And on Twitter, on your Twitter handle, you call yourself an undisciplined professor. Why is that? Well, it, partly it's, it's an, uh, in honor of uh, my colleague, Steve Rayner, who passed away last year, um, who, who I learned a lot from and always introduced himself as an undisciplined professor. Um, but, but the idea is if you do policy relevant research, um, you can't be confined to one discipline. Um, I happen to be trained in, in a field called the policy sciences, um, which is all about integrating knowledge for purpose of uh, understanding policy and policy options. So um, undisciplined seems seems about right. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that one after having read your resume and all and, and all these areas of interest that you have. So I was going to say, let's start off with one uh, of your most topical research areas. But hey, they're all pretty topical. So mm -hmm. I'll I'll say this instead. Let's begin with what I think you're most known for: uh, the climate debate predicament. Would you agree that that's what you're most known for? Yeah, I would. I would think so. I've been doing um, climate-related research since my PhD I, in the early 1990s. I, my PhD was on how we make the best use of climate science in climate policy um, before climate was really a, a big deal. Um, and so I've been working on that topic for almost 30 years. Yeah. Okay. So um, for those who don't know you that well, what is your stance in this matter? I mean, where does the mainstream put you and what is true? Yeah, so, I mean, I view my stance as being um, eminently boring and conventional. Um, I, I have been a supporter of um, the work done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for decades since it started. Uh, my research is cited in the IPCC. Um, where I think um, sometimes I get into trouble um, and where I receive criticism is I 
argue that climate action is compatible, fully compatible with maintaining scientific integrity. And maintaining scientific integrity means being true to the data, to the evidence, even when it may not be so convenient for the strongest claims of, of advocates. Um, and that means pushing back sometimes on, um, on the side that, that I belong to, my political tribe, um, and holding ourselves accountable to what the evidence and the data say. Um, and that's not always popular, uh, but that's you know, that's one reason why we have professors is to do that. So, but you're sometimes called in the mainstream uh, a climate denier or climate skeptic or something like that. I, I yeah, that's. I mean, the, the climate debate is characterized by by the cute little names like that that um, people invoke when they can't critique your research. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, there's there's really no evidence or claims that I've made that would would place me in the climate denier or climate skeptic camp. Um, so it's always a little silly, um, somewhat frustrating, and sometimes just boring to see on social media or elsewhere, um, people try to make those claims. Um, because the idea is if you can tar someone with the, the, the notion of being a climate skeptic, then they can be ignored or dismissed without having to look at their research or the data or the evidence. Um, and that's that's fully expected in any high profile science issue that has policy and political impact. Um, Is it so, so? There's nothing nothing special about the climate debate. Then would you say the climate policy? The climate debate is very well. It, what makes it special is it's so very intense. It's global. Um, it matters a great deal, um, and it has been popularized as a good guys versus bad guys sort of debate. Um, but like any scientific issue. And this one involves the entire economy of the world, the, the energy system, how we want to live to 2100. Um, of course, it's complicated and nuanced in many different points of view. So um, trying to separate out the cartoon image of the simple two-sided debate from the complicated, um, sophisticated, nuanced debate um, is always a challenge. And it's, it's, it's one that, that you know, I've participated in for a long time. Yeah, well, I, I've been participating in this debate on the journalistic side of things and and in in the you know the media and and it seems to of course it's it's more simplified there yeah i guess than in the scientific community when you debate you discuss among your scientific peers and 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 so on you might might get a better a more nuanced discussion but in the main in the mainstream media i can say or in the media in general even in social media yeah. there is very little room for nuance so yeah. i mean the the debate is pretty much locked in everyone's been had painted in painted themselves into a corner, so to speak. Um, and and you have some. I know that you have some. You, you you mentioned it here, but you didn't say very use very many harsh words uh, about it. But I know you have some personal experience of this. There there was, for instance, one one at one time you were summoned to Congress to talk about climate change, and uh, I think it was in two thousand and thirteen. Is that correct? Yes, um, I've been fortunate. I've been able to testify um, before the U.S. Congress um, can, on can many tell occasions. Us about that, yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's many occasions. I, I just yeah. this two thousand. Yeah, I mean, I think I first testified in two thousand three, maybe, and then most recently, um, just a few months ago. Um, but there was one occasion, um, if I might just tell this short story. Um, in yeah, two thousand thirteen, sure. I testified before Congress on some of my research on the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I'll call the IPCC, and the US National Climate Assessment, which is a periodic summary of the state of the science. And I went to Congress to simply summarize what, what does the research say on extreme weather? And extreme weather is a big category, and to understand it, you have to go specific. Hurricanes, floods, drought, tornadoes, and so on. And so I summarized the, the science and it was um, perfectly accurate, consistent with the IPCC. It was on YouTube. Um, and by now it has like 500,000 views. It, yeah, it, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it went, it went viral, so to speak. Um, we'll put a link for the, uh, for the listeners. Yeah. 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 And it was, you know, it's, it, it eventually became a book that I did from that testimony because it was so popular. Um, but it turns out that some members of Congress did not like the message that I sent. And the message I sent was, um, yes, there are some extreme weather phenomenon like heat waves, 
for which there's very good evidence that they have increased in frequency and intensity um, and um, can be attributed to the emissions of greenhouse gases. But there are other extreme weather events like floods and hurricanes or tropical cyclones more broadly um, or meteorological drought for which um, the trends are not so evident. Um, and it, it would be misleading to say this or that hurricane or this German flood was, was caused by climate change. Um, so again, it was a mixed nuanced message, um, but a member of Congress decided that that was not acceptable to present. Um, so in January, 2015, so I gave this testimony before the House of Representatives in 2013. I gave essentially the same testimony to the US Senate in 2014. Then in January, 2015, I remember this like it was yesterday. I was actually coming to Berlin to give a talk on technology assessment and I got off the airplane and my, my, my phone, I don't have it here, but my phone blew up dozens and dozens of messages. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> and they were saying, you know, what are you going to do about the congressional investigation of you? <laughs> and wow. a, mem a member um, of the Democratic Party um, from Arizona um, had claimed that I was perhaps, very sneaky language, I was perhaps taking money from Exxon, oh. the, the oil company in exchange for my testimony, um, which obviously could not be correct. Um, and that set into motion really a, you know, a, a series of events that was profoundly impactful on me, um, sent me in the directions of researching sports, which I continue today to get some space from the climate issue. But it made me realize that, you know, really a, an individual professor is no match for politics in a political mm. system that's, uh, uh, you know, determined to, to undermine their legitimacy. I mean, it all in the end, it all turned out okay. I, you know, obviously, I don't have money from Exxon. I was investigated, um, and you know, but you, you only per, you only perhaps get gets money get money from Exxon. <laughs> well, my Ferrari, the license plate says Exxon on it, but that's a that's a different matter. That's a difference. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so you're perhaps rich now. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So I mean, uh, for me, it emphasized the importance of of in the United States, what we call tenure, academic tenure, academic freedom. Yeah. Um, and I realized, you know, it, it was a painful and, and difficult few years, but I realized that in the end, um, you know, I have a lot of rights and responsibilities as an academic and I use them and mm. I will continue to. Would you say that you're respected today in all, in all camps, uh, in this, in this field of, of, uh, research and uh, No, I mean, there's, I mean, I, there's there's um, probably several times a week I hear on social media or elsewhere, um, you know, that I was investigated by Congress and maybe I'm getting money. So that always sticks with you, that whole delegitimization. Um, and I continue to do research that some perceive as inconvenient to their political objectives. Um, but for me, that just means it's impactful and it's mm -hmm. it's it's good research. Um, so, no, I, I you know, I, I I think the research that I've done cited by the IPCC, it's in the scientific literature, can speak for itself. Um, but anytime you are active as a public intellectual in important contested debates, um, you will rapidly find that there's opposition that, that develops around you as a, as a person and, and around your work. Yeah, so how was, for instance, the, re the reactions to your the tweets that you published, posted in, in, in late August, early September here, when after the, the latest assessment report from the IPCC came out, because when you were very, you stressed very clearly there that, uh, I mean, it, it uh, once again uh, concluded that, that uh, I mean, there is a problem, but it's not the end of, end of the world, to put it briefly. Uh, and you, you gave a lot of examples of that. What, what was the reaction, the general reaction to that, to those tweets? Yeah, so so the IPCC report, the most recent one, is just this the first working group out of three. Yeah, and the, re the report is thousands of pages. Yeah, and it covers an enormous array of expertise. I have particular expertise in two areas. The report covers one is extreme events, and the other is the use of scenarios, which itself is a complicated area. <coughs> um, but I am one of the people who has the expertise in the background to go through that report and summarize it in a way that um, a lay person or someone who doesn't want to take the time to read the whole thing can understand. And uh, the messages on extreme weather 
um, are, you know, are exactly those I've been, you know, arguing for, for years. So, you know, in, in one sense, that's, that's a good vindication for me personally, but also it provides um, what should be a corrective to what we see in a lot of the media, in a lot of the advocacy, advocacy discussions of extreme weather. Um, but for various reasons, and we could talk about that, um, the IPCC report is largely ignored on those points. Yeah. So for the people, for the people who take the time to to read my summary or you know that of others, um, it can be eye opening. The difference, the stark difference between what you read in the New York Times, say, versus what you read in the IPCC, um, and it's you know it's it's a social process like anything else. But extreme weather has been taken up as kind of a what we call a poster child of the climate debate. Um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, but the science is there for those who want to access it. But what do you think it came to this? Uh, because it wasn't like this all uh, all along, I guess. Uh, I mean, a- anyone who says, hold your horses like you do, and, and f- for good reasons, uh, most most of those who do that are kind of, you know, being um, uh, called deniers and, and ostracized, more or less. Why, yeah, yeah. why did it come to this? So I, I'll tell you another little story. So in in 2006, um, I, run, I, I was awarded a very prestigious award by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences um, called the Roger Revelle Award. Um, Roger Revelle was a, a scientist at Harvard in the 1960s and 70s um, who was one of the first to take up the cause of climate change. Um, and I gave a big talk at the, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. There was a thousand people in the audience. Um, that was in the spring of 2006. And the award I got was for my work on extreme weather events and the role of societal change and so on. Well, the world was changing, and I didn't realize it at the time, but just just after I gave my talk, Al Gore's movie came out, An Inconvenient Truth. Oh, yeah, yeah. And people may remember that Al Gore's movie came out very soon after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. And as they were making that movie, they decided to focus it. a lot of the movie on Hurricane Katrina. In fact, the the poster for the movie has a hurricane coming out of a smokestack. Uh And so there was, and this is well-documented, a a colleague of mine named Matt Nisbet at Northeastern has documented this, but but the environmental community, particularly in the United States, decided climate change in 2100 is too far off for people to understand or to appreciate. We need to bring it home to them in the short term. And the way to bring it home to people is to associate extreme weather with climate change. Mm. And so people will understand viscerally and personally what climate change means, regardless of what the science says. Um, At that time, I had written um, a paper, a peer-reviewed paper that said the the conclusive connection of hurricanes and climate change is going to be a long way off for a lot of reasons, but mainly the statistics of a few number of events are very noisy and it takes a long time to see signals, um, not because climate change is not real or or won't have effects. Um, So so starting really about that time, um, I saw my work go from being well-received and applauded to being inconvenient and actually undermined um, in a very public sense. Um, And so, you know, since that time, I've, I've, I've seen efforts to because my work is solid, not to undermine my work, but to undermine me personally, and that the congressional investigation was just one in a long string of these sort of things that that you that you see. But for me, that's that was the, the turning point in you know extreme. It was Al Gore's people. movie in two thousand and six. I think that played a very important role. Um, but at this, you know, at the same time, I think a lot of environmental groups um, and a lot of scientists came on board together to say, all right. Extreme weather is the way we're going to argue this. This is how we're going to promote our advocacy. But today, if you were going to make a movie, it should be called An Inconvenient Truth. (laughs) Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) because now you are the inconvenient one. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's an inconvenient researcher. And, you know, there's a lot of places where for nuance and debate and discussion. and, and, And the frustrating thing is that climate change is real. It's serious. We should be decarbonizing our economy. But we don't have to stomp on science to do that. I mean, science, as we've seen in the pandemic, science is really important to making good decisions. So we should not judge science based on whose cause does it lend support to. Um, we should judge science by is it accurate, is it well supported, is the data good, and so on. And we can do both. We can have good science and have good policy. 
Um, and I just see that, you know, on a lot of topics and climate change is one of them, um, it's very hard to, to maintain that, that, that duality. As you know, Al Gore got the Peace Prize for that movie, uh, mainly for other things as well, I guess, but for his work on, on climate change. Do you think that was a good call? And, and how do you assess that movie? You yeah. So, about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, at the time I wrote a lot about the, the movie and, and, you know, when, when politicians and advocacy groups are making their case for, you know, their pr preferred course of action, of course, they're going to put the best face on it. They're going to, they're going to cherry pick the best data. They're going to make arguments. They're going to push things to the line, maybe over the line. Um, and I, I actually have um, a lot of room and sympathy for politicians and advocacy groups doing that. That's fine. That's that's how politics works. Um, you're never going to get exaggeration out of politics. It would be great if everyone relied on solid science and, and good evidence, but they don't. Um, I have much less time um, or patience for scientists um, or expert advisory bodies who do the same thing. Um, so, you know, the same time that Al Gore won the Nobel Prize, so too did the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel. Yeah, on that's true. Change. That's true. Same year. Yeah. And, yeah, and that that particular report actually was caught up in a lot of controversy because it overstated um, many items, including extreme events, but also that uh, glaciers in, in in the Himalayas would be uh, disappear by twenty thirty five, yeah. for example. Um, and so I I would I I'm much more sympathetic to Al Gore than I was to the IPCC because the IPCC <laughs> has one job, and that's to get the science right. So let's get concrete here, hands on. What are the actual trends in weather extremes and what does the latest IPCC assessment report say about that and also about the, the warming in general? Yeah, so, so one thing to understand as we have this conversation and, and people, I think, I mean, we don't always make this specific, but climate change refers to a, a change in climate. Climate is the statistics of weather um, and other variables. Um, over a period of many decades. And so the, 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 the standard definition of what climate change is, is a change in the statistics of weather over a period of 30 years or more. What that means is that you can't see climate change in 10 years of data. You can see variability on a short time frame. So um, when we're looking at extreme events, and really looking at extreme events is probably the worst place to look for climate change on, on short time frame, because extreme events by definition are rare events. So I, I often illustrate this with, with a deck of cards. Um, if, if you have a deck of cards and I put two more aces into the deck, I've stacked the deck. Yeah. Um, the, the deck has changed, there's no doubt about it, but if you were playing poker or blackjack, you would have to play many, many hands before you had enough statistics to know that that change had actually occurred. Mm. Um, and, and extreme events are very similar um, in that, you know, the number of hurricanes, for example, that have hit the United States um, over the last hundred years is, you know, just several per year. It's not a large number. So the IPCC, um, when it talks about climate change and extreme events, um, <coughs> over the, you know, and, and I guess, again, another factor is we don't have good data for a very long time for, for many phenomena um, around the world. So we have to work with the data that we have. So the IPCC has concluded um, with very high certainty that heat waves in particular have increased um, in intensity and frequency around the world. And heat waves have a societal and economic impact. Um, they have also concluded that what's called extreme precipitation has increased, not everywhere, but in some places. And with a strong hint that it's caused by uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one thing to be very clear, and the IPCC, to its credit, is very clear on this, extreme precipitation does not equal flooding. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and the reason for that, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. So, so here in autumn in Boulder, you can see outside, it's going to rain today. Um, if we were to get two centimeters of rain today, it would be an extreme precipitation day in Boulder because we don't get a lot of rain this time of year, it would not cause a flood. So, so the definition of extreme precipitation is not the same as flooding. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, the IPCC I see. also concludes that, um, that what's called fire weather conditions have increased. This is not fires, 
These are the atmospheric and, and meteorological conditions that lend themselves to having fires. Um, in some places around the world, in the Western United States, um, in particular, we have seen an increase in fires, but not everywhere. Um, and the other area in the IPCC, again, is very nuanced, is, um, is in some aspects of drought. So most of the time when we think of drought, we think of what's called meteorological drought. So not enough rain or hydrological drought, um, not enough you know, water um, in the soils or on the land. Um, but what they found was an increase in what's called ecological drought and agricultural drought. Um, so human most, induced. That's right. So, so those are the four areas where the IPCC found um, some, they detected some trends and they were able to at least partially attribute them to, to the greenhouse gas emissions. Where it gets really interesting is that the headline phenomena, the ones that we see in the front pages of newspapers, tropical cyclones and hurricanes, flooding, meteorological, hydrological drought, tornadoes, strong winds. Um, the IPCC, well, wildfires, um, the IPCC did not judge wildfires specifically. They judge fire weather. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, um, and, and wildfires are a somewhat complex category because we have what are called forest fires, um, but most of the burning that's done on planet Earth is done in the tropical regions for land clearing. It's done by people. Um, and so there's an overall category of fire, and there's a subset of that mm. of forest fires, and it makes, it makes detection and attribution very difficult. Um, but the headline issues, um, the IPCC was very cautious in claiming to have detected trends, much less attribute them to human cause like greenhouse gases. So um, this, is, this is consistent with, with what the IPCC has said before, um, and it's consistent with, this, obviously, the scientific research. Um, but it paints a very different picture of what extreme events look like yeah. than what you would get, you know, in the headlines of your local newspaper. Yeah, this is a, it's it's difficult to wrap your head around it when you're just talking about it. Maybe for for people who haven't heard about this before, but maybe I can for the uh, for the, the YouTube audience um, put in some some graphs, uh, some some. Yeah, I can provide you with some graphs. Yeah, that would be and, and, you know great. Yeah. I, I have this experience with my students. I have this when I ha when I give talks. If you ask a question like. And I and I do this, and um, I'll present a, a, a multiple choice question. You know, has has the state of Florida in the United States, which is very hurricane prone, mm -hmm. um, seen more hurricanes from 1900 to 1960 or 1960 to today? Mm -hmm. And everyone always thinks, well, we've obviously had more in the most recent period. And the answer is no. We it's we had more in that earlier period. Yeah. And it's a little bit like uh, like Hans Rosling, you know, when when he oh yeah yeah I, his... I worked with him for a couple of years actually oh really yeah yeah so so I mean he's he's much more affable and, and personable than me but he he would give these quizzes you know to his audience and, I know. on on you know factfulness and it's very much in that same genre and mm -hmm. the first reaction I can tell you the first reaction I get when I present data on hurricanes is you must be a climate denier. Why else would you present data showing no increase in U.S. hurricanes unless you've cooked the books or manufactured the data or, you know, aren't you reading The Guardian or The New York Times? So it is a challenge to confront people with um, empirical evidence that is completely contrary to what they've come to believe. Yeah, I, I just earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday, I can't remember, I checked some uh, data, some graphs on burnt area in Southern Europe from 1980 to 2019. And this is the European Environmental yeah. Agency, so it's official data. And it's it's actually slightly downward trend uh, if you look at burnt area. And these are the, the, the countries that are mostly yeah. reported on, you know, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, yeah. France, and those countries. And I, uh, I looked at tropical cyclones in Australia. 
Yeah. Same as you were mentioning about Florida here, also slightly downward trend there. And then I also check this, uh, you know, satellite measurements of temperature, but that, that's a different story. So, I mean, th there, there, is, there is data out there for, for anyone <laughs> cooking. Yeah, there's a lot of data out there for people who want it. And, you know, I'm always very cautious. You know, if you have, if, so for example, the United States, we have good, very good data on hurricane landfalls. So hurricanes that strike the United States from about 1900 to today. And so what I tell people is, you tell me what trend you want, mm. and then I'll go pick a starting point. And yeah. I can give you that trend. You want a downward trend? I can give you that. You want an upward trend? I can give you that. <laughs> no. And 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 this gets to the idea that the climate varies and identifying the the you know the secular signal of human caused climate change in noisy data sets. This is why climate change is best detected in a global data set of temperature because it's comprehensive, it's robust, and it shows clear trends above natural variability over time. Um, the more local we get, the more phenomena specific um, the noisier that the data is. Mm. So when people say, well, I observed this or that trend from 1980. Okay. You know, 1980 is not so long ago. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. It's, it's caused by, by, by greenhouse gases. Um, but you know, maybe it's part of natural variability. That's the, that's the intellectual challenge. But there are so the many other, other factors at play here. I mean, if you, if you were talking about wildfires, for instance, I get the impression that hundreds of years ago, there was, there was a, a lot more wildfires because they were natural and, and there were not people around to put them out. But today we, yeah. we, we don't accept any fires. So we get, we panic when, when there is a fire anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the entire concept of wildfires is itself somewhat misleading because many fires are ignited from a human cause. Um, we build houses and other structures in, in forested land. Um, we, we manage forests now. They're not, they're not natural areas. And so this is why fire weather is a much more tractable variable for, for climate scientists to identify trends in than wildfires themselves. Because once you talk about wildfires, you introduce all the policy and societal signals to that, yeah. and you have to disentangle that. Um, it's, it's perfectly plausible that the changes that are resulting from the accumulation of greenhouse gases are leading to more what we could call wildfires. I mean, it, it's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. Hypothesizing that and then documenting it with certainty are two different things. Um, we're at the point now where every time there's an extreme event, every extreme event, whether it's a flash flood in Germany, a flood in China, a typhoon in the Philippines, the first response in, in the public discussion mm -hmm. and in the media is, mm -hmm. oh, this was caused by climate change. I know. Um, it's almost as if there was never disasters before we had <laughs> exactly. That's my impression too. And it's also very easy to 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 hide behind that for m m politicians who haven't perhaps uh, dealt with you know yeah. there having been too many houses being built on on uh, on the shores of rivers and lakes and you know things like that. So they don't have to talk about that. They can just say, oh, it's climate change. We have to cut emissions. We saw this very recently in the United States with um, a, a former tropical system migrated up the East Coast and caused um, flash flooding in New Jersey and New York. And the, the yeah, mayor, yeah. Of New, mayor of New York was very quick to say, well, this is new. We would never expect this sort of thing and it's climate change, but we'll, we'll fix it in the future. The reality was that New York City should have been perfectly prepared for an event of this type, which yeah. was an extreme event, but not at all unusual or unexpected. Reminds so, me of Sandy in 2012, yeah. Hurricane Sandy, because that was a pretty weak a hurricane, but it had a very odd trajectory, as far as I remember. And that was, was the problem, it, wasn't it? It was. It was a uh, a post hurricane, so it wasn't technically a hurricane. It had, I think, one measure of hurricane strength winds, but it was a very powerful storm that that you know took a left turn and, and went in the coast. Had enormous amount of flooding, um, and again, the first response was. Oh, maybe left turns in storms are caused by climate change. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's it's. I think it it can be very misleading to do science in the rear view mirror um, because you can attribute whatever just happened to this or that cause. Um, but the reality is we have a lot of experience all over the world with extremes. And, um, you know, and, and we could talk about this. There's good news. We're much better prepared in general. Um, but just because there's an extreme event doesn't mean it was caused by human caused climate change. No. And um, yeah, 
then there was also uh, another thing that was uh, that was uh, news in the in the in the report, and you mentioned this on Twitter, as far as I remember. Also, is that the um, the range of the um, expected uh, temperature rise? What is it called now? The um, <laughs> if there's a doubling of CO two in the atmosphere, what's yeah, what's the term? Sensitivity. Yeah. Climate sensitivity. Yeah, that was actually lowered. The the top end of that range was lowered to 4.0 degrees Celsius, which was good news, wasn't it? I mean, I, I didn't see that those headlines anywhere. Yeah, so one of the, what should have been one of the, the, the highlights of the IPCC report, um, not just the, the, the reduction of the high end and you know the increase of the bottom end in climate sensitivity estimates, but the scenarios that we depend upon, <coughs> excuse me, the scenarios we depend upon to project future climate, the most extreme scenarios um, the IPCC, for the first time, it says they are low likelihood. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is we're not going to build 30,000 new coal-fired power plants around the world. So the most extreme visions of climate change are much less plausible in 2021 than they were in 2013 when the last IPCC report came out. Yeah. That should be really good news. And, yeah. and um, you know, instead, the United Nations said you know, the report calls it code red for humanity. I know. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Should he I have mean, said that, Antonio Guterres? Well, when he does say that, he, he positions himself as an advocate um, trying to spin rather than to accurately represent. And I guess as you know, the Secretary General, if that's his prerogative. Um, it's when I see IPCC contributors and the IPCC itself adopting that same sort of language mm. where I think we get into some trouble because we mm. want the scientists to play things straight. Mm. Um, and if politicians are going to spin, then they will spin. And, you know, it's their legitimacy that they put at risk when they do that. Um, but, you know, climate change is, is such a popular topic and um, there's so few experts who are willing to, to hold politicians to account that I think it's kind of a free Free for all, and you can claim anything about the report, and you know no one will hold you. Seems account. like it, yeah. And whatever gives um, good headlines. So, yeah. uh, one of the things that one of the um, the changes that uh, are being attributed to to um, the emissions of greenhouse gases is, is that we have more hot days and fewer cold days, which is logical, of course. Yep. Uh, and but that also means that uh, th that that is also coupled to another phenomenon which is people dying from heat and people dying from cold, but that the latter is, is much less reported on. So, uh, because I read some, sometimes uh, con contrary articles about these things and uh, pointing out that, that, I mean, if a little bit, I mean, from the, from the beginning, uh, the baseline, so to speak, is that a lot more people die from cold than from heat. It's been that like that always, I, I think. Uh, there are some studies showing that maybe as many as as much as seventeen times more people die from cold than from heat, but at least it's like six, seven, eight times. There are different studies, but this means that so if we have more <laughs> warm days and fewer cold days, that would mean should mean that a little more people die from heat, but much fewer people also die from cold. So I mean, the the net should be positive there. Is that something that you could? that is even possible to talk about? Or would you be immediately ostracized, uh, ostracized as a denier if you, if you said that? Yeah, you, you may be. Um, my view very much is that um, even though both are temperature, um, talking about a net figure, um, balancing them off is, you know, for me, it's a little bit like talking about the net figure between typhoon deaths and drought deaths. I mean, are, yeah, you have two different phenomena and they, they cause human impacts. I don't think lumping them together for me makes much policy or, or, or scientific sense. The point is, and this is reflected in, in the studies of human exposure to extreme temperatures, whether hot or cold, we have the capabilities to adapt to temperature extremes yeah. such that, and the UN says this, that under successful adaptation, we should expect zero deaths for both. Um, and the fact that we don't re reflects a failure of adaptation. And I mean, th imagine this. Let's say we took Stockholm and we traded it with Phoenix mm -hmm. like that. There would be a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of uh, pale Swedes who would be suffering <laughs> in Phoenix. For sure. And a lot of, a lot of tanned 
Arizonans who would freeze in, in Stockholm. And so I think, I mean, extreme temperature is one that, that we have to recognize is, is one that human society has done well to adapt to. Um, it doesn't make climate change irrelevant or not real, but you know, one of the one of the I guess the dirty secrets of climate research is is almost all, not all, but almost all of the research on the potential future impacts of temperature extremes assume no adaptation. Yeah. We're not going to have extrapolation. That's that's the yeah, that's they hold society constant. And mm -hmm. so that gives a very misleading view of the potential impacts. Um, you know, extreme yes, temperature extremes can have very negative effects on populations. Um, but what we see is because you know we inhabit everywhere from the tropics to the poles, um, human society is very adaptable to temperature extremes. Yeah. So I think you can see that. I mean, in your vicinity among your friends, among people where you live, as you say, if we choose, if you put Stockholm where Phoenix is today, uh, people would have problems. But I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. So I right. I think you can see even today we know that the temperature the, the average temperature here in this country is about I think one and a half degrees higher than it used to yep. be than it was 40, 40, 50 years ago. And um, people have gotten used to that. So I mean, if it's if it's a so quote unquote normal winter, people think it's a terrible winter. And if it's a quote unquote normal summer, so, summer, people right. think it's a cold summer. So it's it's really something that we really adapt to. And and this is a segue over to my, my next question, which is, I mean, you've already started yep. answering it, but regardless of how the trends look, how seriously the climate debaters really take this our our increased resilience and our increased um, proneness to to adapt because it seems as if the weather was you know a lot more dangerous a hundred years ago than today if you look at just the number of people who were killed yeah by hurricanes yeah, well, and floods and, and droughts and everything and one thing to understand about that when we talk about climate and weather impacts on on humans and society and economies um, is that the conditions that we create, our exposure and our vulnerability to those impacts is a much larger factor in the impacts we see than the climate itself. Yeah. Um, and so whether or not the, the, the climate and weather events were more extreme 100 years ago, it is absolutely undeniable that the impacts on human society were, were vastly larger. So, so a statistic I like to share is if you were to pick a human being at random in the 1920s on planet Earth, there's a one in 1,000 chance that person would die in an extreme weather or climate event. We saw millions of people die in that decade um, due to drought, due to floods, due to um, tropical cyclones. If you pick a random person on planet Earth today, there's a one in 400,000 chance that they would oh. die in an extreme weather event. Yeah. It is it is a 99.75% uh, reduction in, in the risk. Yeah. Um, that's good news. And that's because society has become wealthier. We have, we have early warning systems. We don't build in places we know that are prone um, to disasters. Um, we are better adapted to climate. Um, yeah. that's, that signal of, re of reduced vulnerability can be seen across all phenomena and pretty much all places around the world. It's a it's an unheralded scientific and technological success story of the past century. It is, yeah. I, I'm sure you're familiar with Bjorn Lomborg, the Danish yes. economist who's written yes. books about these right. things, and he he says things like it's economic madness to bet everything on one horse, so to speak, which is cutting emissions when it would be much smarter and cheaper. To adapt to inevitable changes and switch energy systems gradually. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So I've I've um, I've had discussions and debates with Bjorn for about twenty years now. Uh, okay. And we agree on some things and not on others. And I guess the first point I would disagree with is that adaptation and mitigation, so better preparing for extreme versus reducing emissions, um, they're not trade offs. They're they're different policies that operate on vastly different timescales. Um, I, I would never say we should mitigate climate change so we can control the weather. That's, that's, that's not why we're mitigating. If, if we were to dramatically start reducing emissions today, for the same reasons as I was talking about with the poker game and the aces, 
we wouldn't be able to detect those changes on the weather um, for many decades, if not longer. So obviously it's not a control knob for getting rid of floods or hurricanes as some might suggest. Um, at the same time, um, adaptation to, to weather events and climate events is in everybody's interest, regardless of what you think about climate change. Um, you know, the, the ideal number of people to die in disasters is zero. And until we get there, we still have, have work to do. Um, for mitigation, and, and this is the case that I make that um, I think is different than, than Lombard, the best reasons for mitigating climate change are actually somewhat adjacent or tangential to, to the climate change concerns. Um, if you take a look at air pollution deaths worldwide, various estimates, 4 million, 8 million, it's a big number. Air pollution comes from the, um, a lot of air pollution comes from the burning of fossil fuels, particularly coal, um, but also natural gas that put uh, particulates into the atmosphere and lead to premature deaths. Um, there are enormous parts of the world and large populations numbering in the billions where people still lack energy access and energy services that you and I enjoy without thinking about it every single day. So there is a profound need for the world to modernize and improve its technologies of energy production and energy consumption. Um, yeah, if, if people wanted to do that and um, they're motivated by climate change concerns, that's great. Um, but I can also make a very compelling economic argument, say to Republicans in the United States, that, hey, decarbonizing our economy is good for business, it's good for national security, it's good for the security of energy supply. We see this crisis in Europe and in the UK in particular right now due to natural gas volatility. So I think if we just put changes in energy policy all on top of climate change, um, we get a, a misleading view of the debate and the policy options in front of us. Um, and so that, that tends to put people like Bjorn and in, in, in that camp um, in opposition to what otherwise would be really rational, pragmatic changes to energy policy that make sense for reasons beyond just cutting emissions, um, mm. but have that effect of cutting emissions. Um, I can make a very compelling case for the world to, to wean itself off of coal energy um, <laughs> very quickly um, for non-climate reasons and put the climate reasons on top of it. It's even better. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Interesting. Uh, well, I think you hinted before that, um, the, the way that science has been handled in climate policy is, is more or less the norm. It would be handled the same way uh, from a policy perspective in other areas as well. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you were saying. Yeah. But yeah. Well, the, the, the dynamics are the same. The intensity is a lot yeah. higher. Okay. So let's go over to another very topical area then and, and, and ask a question. How has science been handled, used, and presented uh, during the pandemic, very much uh, already going yeah. on. Uh, I mean, still going on. Yeah, I can tell you, um, when we have a number of our case studies from our, our international project um, yeah. coming in. I mean, the short answer is, is not great. Um, on the one hand, um, the, the, the science and technological skills that led to the vaccinations are an incredible success story. <laughs> it's it's un undoubtedly, you know, we we would not be in um, the positive situation that we see in many parts of the world, not everywhere, um, thanks to vaccination. That said, when we look at science advisory mechanisms, so these are experts who are put together by governments to advise policymakers on what should we do, particularly early on in the pandemic. What we've learned is many parts of the world were not well organized in advance of the pandemic to even provide that sort of advice. An example would be most pandemic advisory bodies, very high level around the world, were focused on public health. At one sense, oh, that makes sense because pandemics are a public health issue. What we've learned in COVID is that a pandemic is also an economic issue. And the fault line in many countries on pandemic policy was you know, shutdowns, lockdowns versus the economy and jobs and, and GDP. Um, I have yet to find any advisory body anywhere in the world that 
put together economics expertise and public health expertise um, to develop policy options. So, so in many places, I think Sweden is the same. Um, the, the, the debate very early on was, was distilled to lockdown, no lockdown. Um, a very black and white mm, mm, um, mm. sort of um, two-sided extreme debate. When in reality, we could imagine many different versions of that. Yeah, in between. I think Sweden was a good example of a soft. I mean, we didn't have lockdown, right? But there were restrictions, of right. course, uh, right. for a year or so. So I mean, it was a softer version, <laughs> if yeah. you will. Um, yeah. Well, I think I think I, I, I've been uh, talking to epidemiologists, um, notably a couple of those professors who are signatories of this, you know, the Great Barrington Declaration, they yeah. were very critical to to, uh, to lockdowns and uh, spoke to Martin Kuldorf and uh, Senator Gupta. Yeah. And and they were shocked that all these, you know, preparedness, preparedness plans that were in place that the WHO had, had worked out for, I mean, 20 years or so, they were just thrown out of the window. And suddenly every country just locked down and, and they didn't care about what's, what was written beforehand. The, 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 what, do you, what do you think about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, so this, I mean, this raises a, re a really interesting dynamic that we see um, in many countries. So the, so the Great Barrington Declaration and, and the, the individuals involved with that and the signatories to that, um, it has some standing, it has a name and we talk about it, um, but they're a self-organized group of people with credentials and relevant expertise. And that's part of a larger trend of what we see and, and what we're calling in our project shadow science advice. Um, obviously there's a group in Sweden, um, the, the, the science forum, I believe it's called. Um, we see this um, in the United States with um, an individual named Scott Atlas who was on TV and eventually Donald Trump brought him in. Um, we see this in the United Kingdom with the so-called independent sage. Um, and what that shows is that experts for various reasons decided to self-organize to oppose or in some cases to complement formal government advisory bodies. Uh, but what that did was create um, much more confusion amongst the public and the media than probably was necessary because you have all of these legitimate or not legitimate um, science bodies competing with each other. Um, there was a, a group in the Netherlands called the Red Team, which at one point said, we're going to stand down because we don't think we're helping the process anymore. We don't see that very often where groups mm. stand down. That's true. Um, the independent sage in the UK is now shifting its attention to climate change. Um, and so when you have oppositional experts um, who may be opposed to the government or opposed to the government's policies, um, that can make the implementation of policy much more challenging and difficult. Um, but again, it, it gets to the point that um, start with the WHO and their advisory process for um, declaring a public health emergency of international concern. Um, come to the United States where there's no high level advisory body. The UK, it's contested. In Sweden, it's been contested. Um, we see that that overall, the world and, and the, the component governance, governments um, just were not prepared to um, develop policy options and then see them evolve um, because most, I mean, honestly, most preparations for a pandemic were preparing for an influenza pandemic, not a novel coronavirus pandemic, which are different mm -hmm. and require different sorts of expertise and different sorts of modeling. Um, and, you know, simple questions like airborne transmission uh, or wearing masks um, were overly politicized and contested in ways that I think um, wouldn't have been solved with better expert advisory processes, but the politics might have been diffused a little yeah, bit. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe it's a good idea. To, I mean, that's already happening, of course. Comparing different countries that have chosen different paths here and see what what worked and what didn't work, and then you have to, of course, uh, I mean, uh, take t take account of take account for differences in in the population uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so on and so forth. But uh, this is this has to be done, I guess. For instance. Speaking about uh, face masks, we never wore face masks in Sweden. Uh, right, right. It was never mandatory, right, but it right. was in Britain and Spain and France yeah. and Italy and all these countries. I mean, what did it do? Did it do anything? Uh, that would be very interesting to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this is exactly the sort of question that that we need 
high level expert advisory bodies to be able to answer. Yeah. Um, that that <laughs> in principle, the question is of how effective are masks is an empirical question. It's a scientific question. And um, it, it, we should be able to do better than to have a study here, a study there. Here's a study. There's a study yeah. where people can go out and go shopping for the result they want. Um, so, so there's no requirement that Sweden or the United States or Great Britain would have to follow the guidance of the experts. But having that guidance provides a touchstone so that policymakers can say, here's why or why not I'm following that guidance. It helps with democratic accountability. It also helps to insulate the experts from, from political influence. Um, and the fact that we don't have that yet, um, in, you know, this far into the pandemic for me is a, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a large intelligence failure. It's, it's unnecessary. It's an, it's an own goal sort of situation. Mm. Hmm. Okay, so to combine these two big areas here, climate and COVID, do you think that the most alarmist among the, uh, the climate word people uh, think that what we are in for is something like what we experienced during the pandemic? Or, or do, do, do you think they think it's going to be worse than that? Strange yeah, question. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's a good, good question. I mean, the reality is um, the pandemic um, has evolved over you know, now two years. Um, and climate change is a, is a phenomenon we'll be dealing with forever. Um, and you know, there are scenarios of abrupt, severe climate change, but they are more speculative. IPCC does not. Yeah, but in people's data. minds, I mean, in people's minds, those who yeah. don't know what you know, and maybe I know, they, they, I guess they have some scenarios. People are very anxious, afraid, <coughs> scared. Young people are w- want to commit suicide because they think they're going to die from from climate change. Uh, it's happening. Yeah, uh, there, there is this this inherent paradox in the climate messaging and, and climate advocacy that the, the, the more and more success that we have, and, and, and let me be honest, there are very positive signs in, in global energy. Um, the Paris Agreement, I mean, the IEA, International uh, Energy Agency, just put out a report yesterday um, that showed dramatic um, reductions in our expected emissions to 2050 following the Paris Agreement. Um, the more and more success that the world has, whether it's deploying electric cars or retiring coal-fired power plants, the less and less likely apocalyptic scenarios are. Mm. Um, and so at some point, policy success and apocalyptic scenarios are, are going to be widely viewed to be completely incompatible. Um, and so there is a risk that in amplifying code red for humanity, mm. amplifying um, the, the fear message on climate change, it could damage the legitimacy of the overall policy regime, which again, let's be honest, changing the course of the global energy system is a many decade, if not century long challenge. Um, it is not something that is going to be done by 2025 or 2030 or even 2050. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's irresponsible for, particularly for us experts to suggest, you know, and I, I think this, we saw this in the UK this week, um, the environment agency minister um, put out a report that was titled adapt or die. Hmm. Um, and to suggest that people are going to die because of climate change, I think it's just irresponsible because, um, in fact, the trends are in the positive direction. And they, they can continue for a long time if we, if we continue what we've been doing. Do you think we can learn anything from the pandemic uh, that we can bring with us to the, to the continued climate debate in the future? It, you know, so, so it's really interesting that, that the UK put out its third coronavirus um, inquiry from parliament um, a couple of days ago. And in it, they expressed a desire for experts to challenge scientific consensus. They want politicians and experts. They said it's very difficult to challenge a consensus, but robust knowledge and good policy depends upon that. And very this, is, this is exactly the opposite of what we say in climate change, which is don't challenge any scientific consensus. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the lessons I hope we take from the pandemic is the absolute importance of open debate, discussion. Um, and, and if we look at the, you know, the, the last 30 years of climate policy, um, the Kyoto Protocol yeah. was a failure. Yeah. The cap and trade regime was a failure. 
um, the European emissions trading scheme maybe <laughs> did a little, but overall a failure. Um, carbon offsets, a failure. Um, paying Norway, paying Indonesia not to deforest lands, a failure. We have to recognize that, that science and policy proceed as much by identifying error as it does by holding fast to a, a consensus view. And the pandemic should, I would hope, give us some humility in how we approach these challenges. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. <laughs> and if being wrong sometimes means that we make ourselves more right over the long term, then we should invite challenges to claims that hurricanes are getting worse or that more people will die in heat waves. Um, it's okay for people to have different points of view. And as we see in the pandemic, um, sometimes uh, we can improve our understandings by having more challenges. Wonderful. Roger, finally, a sports question. I know you, you love sports. <laughs> and uh, Sweden is about to qualify for the world, the, the soccer world, world cup next year. So it's going to be hold, held in Qatar uh, on the, in the Persian right. Gulf in November and December. Is that okay? The whole process that Qatar was selected um, is one of a long history, sordid history of bribes and corruption in, in the highest levels of world soccer. Um, I, I'm not hopeful that, that, Things have changed uh, all that much, um, but people love the World Cup, and and we will all hold our noses and watch <laughs> the November. World we Cup will, and I know. Yeah, we can complain. You're on a want, 76 year old Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And exactly. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna like to say hold our our noses and watch it. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. So, yeah. Roger Pilkey, it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest and. Keep up the good work and good luck with every iron you have there in your fire. Thank you, Anders. I really appreciate the opportunity. If you like this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. Thank you.